Salve, buongiorno, eh, un saluto cordiale a Nicola e a tutti i miei colleghi in Italia. Grazie per l'invito e eh, la mia presentazione sarà in inglese. Eh, spero che vada bene. La tecnologia nuova. Okay. In 2016 I participated in a LIDAR survey called the Pakunam LIDAR Initiative. This was the first large LIDAR survey in an area called the Maya Biosphere Reserve, where I've been working for 20 years uh, uh, previously. And um, this was a long-awaited project that we had been working on for, for many years with several colleagues. And um, we're very grateful that um, this Guatemalan Foundation, the Pakunam Foundation, uh, adopted this idea that um, we should use a new technology to increase our potential for mapping large areas in great detail and therefore fast forward um, the, uh, our ability to understand the Maya uh, civilization and their impact on the environment. And so um, in 2016, Pakunam grouped uh, a number of projects that they supported uh, Altogether, we were 16 scholars from 11 institutions. And I think uh, we owe it to the foundation to uh, force us to collaborate together and to share our data every step of the way uh, and to work on a joint publication that came in 2018 in the journal uh, Science, uh, which is just one of many publications we have uh, been able to uh, produce thanks to this rather unique and, and uh, successful um, large uh, co collaboration. And so here's the, uh, the title of, of our um, article uh, in 2018, uh, clearly uh, marks a turning point in, the, we hope, in the way uh, archaeological surveys will be done in the Maya lowlands, uh, as well as in um, the Amara collaboration that will be done after those surveys are done because the, the data is just so dense and overwhelming that no research uh, project really can handle it on its own, especially since these surveys tend to be larger and larger. So we hope, uh, uh, while this was not um, the first uh, LIDAR survey in the Maya Lolas, we hope we did something new that uh, will have um, an impact in terms of not only the information that we recovered, but also the way we approached uh, the research. Uh, many of you might not know, but uh, Maya archaeology is still in its infancy, even though uh, we've had um, archaeological research in Mexico and Guatemala, Honduras, and Salvador and Belize uh, ever since the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, as a result, we have a large database of archaeological sites, uh, about 6,000 on the map right now. But for many of them, we don't have any information. In fact, almost 99% uh, of these sites are just dots on the map for which we don't have any information. And unfortunately, um, because of the uh, remoteness of certain areas uh, away from highways and uh, places where uh, we can uh, support um, uh, human habitation. <laughs> uh, work has been very slow. Um, in, if that's true in archaeology, my archaeology in general, but especially mapping, because we have to, we, to contend with this very difficult environment. We use relatively primitive methods, now supplemented obviously by GPS and digital tablets, but still we rely on either total stations or uh, tape and compass to take our measurements and measure archaeological features on the surface. And as you can imagine, uh, LIDAR came in and um, incredibly uh, improved our ability to map um, large areas in much greater detail than was possible using these uh, traditional methods. So one of the distinctions of our survey was that it was the largest uh, archaeological service undertaken in Maya archaeology up to this point. 
uh, 2,100 square kilometers, distributed over a number of um, uh, survey blocks uh, managed by different projects, institutions, but that uh, together make up the largest cross section of the Maya lowlands ever recorded. And these 2,000 square kilometers, we realized were representative of a sampling universe that really is the heart of the Maya lowlands, an area we call the central Maya lowlands of about 90 square kilometers. So uh, using this well-sized sample, we're able to make inferences not only on the density and, and the uh, amount of infrastructure Maya built in this area, but also beyond in uh, beyond our sampling. Uh, One of the advantages we had was that we collaborated in this with the leading institution in archaeological mapping uh, in the Western Hemisphere, the uh, University of Houston's National Center for Airborne Biomapping. They've been doing uh, archaeological surveys in tropical forests since um, 2010. So um, not only they provided the newest uh, instrument, the Optech Teledyne Titan for this, but also uh, 10 years of experience in refining not only the collection, but also the uh, processing um, of uh, data specifically geared to bring out very subtle and um, difficult to, to isolate uh, archaeological uh, surface on the feature, uh, surface features. In addition to that advantage, we also had a large, uh, relative, now it turns out to be small, but we thought relatively sizable uh, pre-LIDAR mapping um, uh, background. A uh, hundred years of archaeological investigation in this region have resulted in about 167 square kilometers mapped, which represents about 8% of a LIDAR sample. Uh, so we thought we, we could use that well as the beginning um, to verify the features that we had um, observed on the LIDAR, in addition to post-LIDAR surveys done uh, on, on certain other features that do not appear on the pre-LIDAR maps. And so just to answer a quick question of what did LIDAR do for us, I want to show this slide of the era that was mapped uh, in my research uh, uh, region for about 15 years before LIDAR. We had about a thousand structures uh, mapped, uh, mostly residential structures, as also pyramids and plazas. Uh, and uh, in two, probably two and a half days of uh, airplane time, um, the LIDAR produced 5,000 structures and um, if that wasn't enough, we, we realized that some of the areas that we thought were swamps and unusable to the Maya were actually turned into some of the most productive agricultural uh, fields by digging drainage channels and to regulate the floods so that they will be irrigated throughout the year. Also defensive uh, works earthworks, uh, moat and ramparts on, on the ridge lines. Every hill, almost every hill was fortified. And uh, on the hillsides, uh, thousands and thousands of uh, terraces to maximize every hectare of usable land for production. So we uh, realized um, not only there were more people than we thought living on this landscape, but also that they had found ways to geoengineer the landscape to maximize production and sustainability. Now, some of the biggest revelations and most significant finds came in the um, uh, area of urbanism. Uh, to begin with, you know, many, almost all the sites turned out to be larger than we thought. Um, Tikal is an emblematic case in which uh, we had a map uh, of 16 square kilometers done by the University of Pennsylvania. Our LIDAR mapped about 90 kilometers. Uh, in addition to that, outside, outside of the city of continuous settlement. And the projections now are that the settlement is actually much bigger 
to include all these uh, ridge lines outside of uh, the current LIDAR map that if we can um, bring the LIDAR survey to them uh, will turn out to be a continuous urban settlement as you can see in some of these other areas further to the west and to the north. Uh, and so um, this gave us a complete different picture on the, the size of cities as well as the uh, density of the population within the center. Like I said, many other sites uh, follow the same pattern. Here we have a site of El Palmar um, to the west of Tikal. Uh, the red box uh, indicates the area that was known before LIDAR. And uh, we thought there were other sites around it. It turned out to be one site actually is sprawling from this area and it's all settlement and uh, ceremonial complexes connected by causeways 40 times larger than the initial thought. And in this slide you can see uh, the great variability that we now can detect in this uh, vast region, uh, the heart of the Maya uh, lowlands, with a very uh, sparse settlement to the west going to a high density, large cities in the center and to the north, and somewhat smaller cities to the east. And some of the denser cities actually are here um, in the west. So great variability in terms of uh, the uh, nucleation as well as the, uh, the sprawl of uh, Maya settlement. But one thing this picture also in the, suggests is that if we were to map the entirety of this region, we would probably find continuous settlement everywhere uh, there is uh, dry high ground, basically, which is astounding. And so how they fed all these people, um, we, uh, we found that um, they were converting the swamps into irrigated fields. Uh, by using these uh, systems of drainage channels uh, uh, to regulate um, excess water during rainfall and bring water from natural stream, uh, streams at the end of the uh, rainy season. And so uh, not only we had large uh, uh, amounts of people, but now we could see how they supported such large populations by uh, increasing production uh, in, by orders of magnitude in covering these, these swamps. And in, in this area at Homo, in my research area, we noted that the amount of uh, agricultural fields um, produced uh, more food than might have been needed by the local population. And so they, they must have exported it. And in other places where we have large cities like Tikal, even though they converted vast areas of the, of the wetlands, to agricultural fields, they still fell short of the needs of their dense population. And so they must have imported food from areas like Como only 30 kilometers to the east. Again, the interconnect that's Maya cities in terms of their subsistence is something uh, we did not know before. The only light are revealed. Uh, here are some examples of these uh, 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 residential areas with fields, uh, with property walls and terracing and uh, what we call box plots, uh, uh, hanging gardens and uh, check dams to stop erosion. Uh, here you have some, um, look like um, an orchard with individual plots for different crops, something probably very specialized. And again, this is something that we see everywhere in our sample. Uh, another thing that was revealed by LIDAR is the large number of uh, causeways connecting large and small cities. Almost all settlement was connected by some other settlement by causeways. And so we have uh, here too great variability. There are some cities that had number of highways radiating out to other cities. And some cities like Tikal, there were outliers again, even in this, uh, for having fewer causeways, but some of the widest, uh, more monumental causeways, primarily for uh, connecting ceremonial complexes within the city center. 
Other things of note is the ability of the Maya to collect water. We knew uh, they had done extensive water management uh, uh, build up at uh, Tikal, um, uh, damming the natural drainages to, to create these water catchment systems. Uh, but now we see that over and over again in other cities, even cities much older uh, in the pre-classic period, so first millennium BC. Uh, here we have an example from the pre-classic city of Tintal where they actually created a channel to drain an entire wetland um, around which the city is located, um, clearly as a measure to prevent destructive flood over their city. And here you can see how this channel that is two kilometers long would have drained um, water from this wetland in uh, case of a disastrous, hopefully rare flood. Another sense of the great scale of everything the Maya did uh, was the defensive walls, uh, in this case around Tikal, 14 kilometers of a single uh, moat and rampart uh, system. Uh, we only have half of it, and again, we hope with new LIDAR to, to see the other half, maybe encircling the entirety of the city. But many other places now uh, were fortified um, to a degree that nobody suspected. One of the most uh, fortified areas is this ridge line to the west of um, in the kingdom of El Sots, where we have multiple rings of uh, uh, ramparts on the hillsides and an, an entire uh, ridge uh, uh, made of uh, fortified hills um, from for about 11 kilometers uh, looking out towards the camp. Um, again, a, there's ongoing research at these sites to uh, understand when these were built and uh, who they might have been trying to uh, protect themselves from. And again, this is uh, occurring in other places. This is uh, towards the east. Again, you see an example of these heavily fortified hilltops, uh, very much uh, like prehistoric or Iron Age hill forts in, uh, in Central and Western Europe. So again, LIDAR has helped us enormously, a real uh, revolution in terms of the amount of data and the, the detail in the data that we have for settlement and agricultural and infrastructure, urbanism. Uh, it really changed our understanding of the scale of not only the population that goes now for this central area from 1 million to almost 11 million, um, but uh, also the complexity of the uh, urban uh, centers and their interconnectedness um, and, and especially important, a new realization that the Maya may have been able to uh, manage their environment in a way that made it even more sustainable than we previously thought. So again, all these were uh, notions that um, require a revision now, uh, thanks to LIDAR. But I think I want to close with the most important, I think, consideration is that the future of LIDAR research in, in our field will be increased collaboration with ever larger pools of researchers coming together to analyze data together and share experiences and, um, and resources um, to just benefit um, you know, ever a greater uh, scope in, uh, in research uh, and, and publications uh, of, our, of our results. And so I um, also want to close with the hope that this um, uh, pool of researchers can be opened up to citizen scientists in the future, because um, um, we certainly can use more eyes and more brains to identify features on the LIDAR as well as going out there to find them in the field. So hopefully in the future, we'll be opening this up to some sort of crowdsourcing. And I uh, just want to thank you all for your attention. And grazie tante.